Are you guys ready to jump in the word this morning? Yes. Amen. We're going we're gonna to continue along the lines uh, that we started uh, about a month and a half ago now called Monsters. And uh, Monsters is a series, and we're really kind of closing up. It may be this week and maybe, maybe one more week that we close this series down, but we've been talking about things that, that wage war against your faith, uh, against the faith, that is, who you are in Christ. And uh, if, you have, if you've been al- alive long enough, you realize that really on a daily basis, something's trying to pull you out of who God designed you to be uh, every single day. It, the Bible talks about it. It calls it the dust of the earth. And so as long as flesh exists, you will pick up dust along the way. Just no way to avoid that. That's why it's important that as Jesus showed the disciples, we wash uh, the feet. We wash each other's feet. How do we wash each other's feet? By the washing of the water of the word, right? So when you know Bible, when you, when you understand scripture and the, and the beauty of what God's promised us, then you can wash off that daily dust. You can kick it off. What was the, what was the devil told that he would eat from, since the Garden of Eden? He would eat the dust of the earth. And so I'm devourable. I'm undevourable as long as I don't carry dust. How do I keep the dust off? I wash my feet with the water of the word. Don't forget, just like Jesus did, we also dry our feet off. You dry your feet with a towel of linen, which represents righteousness. Amen. Someone say, I've been made right because of what Jesus did. Uh, This morning, I want to talk to you about a subject called the last atom, the last atom. And that's not about electrons and neutrons. Praise the Lord. We're talking about a man that God sent in the beginning and the last one that he sent 2,000 years ago. We talked a little bit last week or two weeks ago, rather, about Paul's passion, really the call of God on Paul to preach the whole counsel of God's will. It sounds super uh, challenging to understand the whole counsel. Like it's got to be incredibly uh, complicated to know everything about God's will on the earth. And yet Paul breaks things down over over and over again in scripture and shows us how truly simple God designed his promises to be received. We, We remind you from Acts 20, 27, Paul said, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, that is the will of God, the plan, the purpose. Paul made it his life's mission to share with people the mission, the will of God. And here's three verses earlier, he actually describes what this whole counsel of God is. This impossible idea for me to ever figure out. No man can know just how, how, how great and mighty God is. Well, listen to how simple it actually is in verse 24 of Acts 20. Here is the ministry which I received from Jesus, he says. Here it is. To testify fully. That's what the Greek supports. It's not just to say it, but to testify fully to the gospel of what? Of the grace of God. Paul did not come just to teach random topics to make people better people. He came to preach the life-giving power of the grace of God. And it is that grace, that eternal goodness. It is the reality that he freely gave us the gift of perfection. That message is what transforms us. So instead of going after someone's behavioral modification, God went after heart transformation. And if you can change somebody's heart, you'll change what they do on the outside. Too often I see preachers going after the outside, trying to shave off the bad habits, the addictions. I have no doubt in this room, some of us have come together today and there is an addiction that's secret in your heart. It's been beating you up and chasing you down for decades now. The answer to getting out of that addiction is not to try to stop doing it. It's to meditate. It's to hear over and over again just how radically God loves you anyway. That even despite my own addictions, God still loves me eternally. And it's that absurdity of love that will drive us away from the action that we know inherently is devastating. The truth is, is that you don't need a preacher to tell you to stop doing bad. We all know. We all know what's bad and what's good. We like get it. Why, but, but so it gets really monotonous and like, okay, duh. I know I shouldn't murder. Hello. 
don't really need God to tell me thou shalt not murder, but, but there's, a, there's not enough revelation that he loves me even if I murder. That even if I did something devastatingly wrong on this side of eternity, he loved me anyway. In fact, it's that tendency to sin that drew him toward me. Amen. That while we were still sinners, that Christ died for me. Yes. Before I cleaned up, before I did anything good, Amen. God died for me anyway. Amen. He gave everything with no promise that I would respond. This is profound. It doesn't make sense to our mind because surely God has an expectation of my activity in order to please him. But the truth is that my activity could never be close enough to perfect to please him. Not my greatest efforts. No, there's something that God has up his sleeve in the name and what he did in Jesus that was gonna radically transform the earth. You see, you'll do better under grace on accident than you will ever do on purpose trying to keep the law. You will live better on accident when grace is your, your jurisdiction than you will ever do on purpose trying to keep the law. What's the law? Well, if you've been coming here a while, you know what it is. It's the work of your flesh to try to earn something from God. If you can measure your activity and say, okay, I prayed three hours, therefore I deserve blank. That's called the law. That's called God's waiting for you to do something. The reality is, is that at the cross, Jesus did it all. And what scares people is they think, whoa, 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 careful there, preacher. You're telling people not to pray. Wrong. Don't make me go Batman on you. No, I'm not telling people not to pray. I'm telling them why to pray. I'm changing the, the, the reason that they go after it. The motivation of prayer is not to get something. It's because I believe he's already provided. And I can freely come to him and make my request known. God, I know that this is a promise you gave for me. And it doesn't require any activity on my part. I have one job. And what's my one job? Believe. To believe. That's all that God gave me. Man, we want so much more. But God said, no, you don't get a vote in your role. You don't get to decide what you get to do to make me happy. God says, I already made the decision. And it's my son, Jesus. He fully satisfied the requirements that you and I were supposed to pay for. Aren't you glad for Jesus this morning? If you live according to the flesh or according to the spirit, really it's our decision. It's our choice. This is the free will that God has given to mankind that continues to befuddle religion. Religion says, well, God's in control of everything. And so whatever happens, it must be the will of God. The Bible actually says is that it's God's will for all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The, the will of God doesn't always happen. Can I get an amen? amen? You have a role to play. You have a choice to make. And the choice is not, am I going to obey God? The choice is, am I going to live according to what life was like before Jesus? Or am I going to accept the gift that came after Jesus? This isn't a choice just for the church, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't just a message just for people that happen to go to an American style church. This is what Jesus preached, what Paul preached 2000 years ago. This is a choice that every man, woman and child must make at some point in their life. Will I decide to, to lean on the grace of God and what God has provided? Or will I do things the way it was before that, where it was up to me? Now, Paul said it like this in Romans chapter six and verse 16. He said, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves, to whom you present yourself a slave? Now, this word slave is not like we imagine where you are forced into labor for someone else. This word slave actually carries a level of dignity with it. The better term for us would be the word bond servant. A bond servant is someone who willingly turns their rights over to someone else. That's what Paul's saying here via the context. He's saying, to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, that you are that one's slaves whom you obey. He says, you can either be a bond servant to, to one of two things. Either, number one, you can be a bond servant to sin that leads to death, or you can be a bond servant to, to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, listen, if you're not careful, if you just read through this, if you don't understand what Jesus did, that last line throws a lot of people off. 
Some will look at that and say, well, there you go, preacher. Obedience is what leads to righteousness. Well, here's the problem. That's not what Paul said at all. And what Paul understands is if you read Romans chapter six, you probably read Romans chapter five, which comes first, five or six, five, right? This is a letter. And so don't just start jumping around in the pages of your Bible and saying, well, I told you, here it is right here. No, get some context. In fact, let's back up to Romans five and let's see what he's talking about. Sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Here's what he said. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Who's that? That's Adam. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Obedience leading to righteousness is not you, <laughs> it's Jesus. So what Paul is saying is you gotta choose, friend. Do you wanna do it Adam's way or do you wanna do it Jesus' way? Adam's way was I gotta do something in this flesh to impress God. Adam's way was there's more work to do. Jesus' way is his obedience was already perfect. The crazy thing about Jesus was he received the reward of perfection and he said, I want you to have it. This blessing that you read throughout the Old Testament, if you will uh, obey the, the rules uh, of the law, if you'll pray and if you'll seek God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then you'll get something from God. That's the rules of the, of the flesh, the old covenant. And it was tough, if not impossible to keep. Jesus said, guys, I'm gonna do it for you. And then he said, I'm gonna give the, you the reward of that. What's crazy about grace is that Jesus says, here's the faith that you need, Brandon, to live life. And then he says on top of that, God's gonna put the desire to do his will in your heart. And then once you do his will, because he gave you the strength and the desire to do it, now God says, I'm gonna reward you for the work that you did. Where's my name in any of that? Why is it that we're so hungry for credit when Jesus says, give me all the credit and I'll give you all the reward? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't deserve any of it. Jesus did it all. Can I get an amen? amen? Thinking that you can bring your obedience to please God, it's like taking a thimble, a small little container into the ocean. My wife and I, we took the kids down to the ocean. That's a big place. You ever seen the ocean before? That's a lot of water. How about if you took a little thimble and said, pull it up out of the water, like I've done something, Father. Like I've made fire, you know. I've, here I have, this is my work of righteousness. And God, surely as I empty out this ocean with my thimble, this is thimbleism, by the way. That's what I call this. <laughs> I'm being thimbolic. Is that okay? Here. Here's, my, here's my thimble. I can't even say the word anymore, okay? <laughs> Here's my uh, ramekin. God, take this and let it please you. And God says, there's too much. Your little tiny actions can't even get close to the reality of how desperately we needed God. You ever seen a movie called uh, The Count of Monte Cristo? Yep. Really great movie. Uh, Jim Caviezel's in it. Jesus himself, he's Looks like Jesus, acted as Jesus. He may be Jesus, I don't know. But uh, so Jim is in this movie and he's, uh, he's Edmund Dantes and, and he's escaped from prison. You know, he was falsely accused. If you've never seen the movie, it's a really great, great film, good family movie. And he's finally escaped uh, from his prison and, he, and he's on this uh, beach where he lands and he's so happy and free. And he accidentally comes across a band of pirates and this band of pirates is about to execute one of their own um, this, this guy that's about to be killed uh, had, had traded against the pirates. And so the pirates say, we're gonna give you one more chance to redeem yourself. They, they grab Edmund as he was running and they give Edmund a knife and they say, you guys battle it out to the death. Take a second and look at exactly what this, this was like. Do not move an eyelash. Senor Vampa, allow Jacopo to live. He's already suffered enough with the prospect of being buried alive. 
men that wanted to see some sport have seen it. Those who wanted mercy for Jacopo will get it. And by keeping me in Jacopo, you will have yet another skilled sailor and fighter for your crew. It's a deal. I swear on my dead relatives, even on the ones that are not feeling too good. I am your man forever. I know. I am your man forever. Come on, Jacopo. Y'all, you got to love the name Jacopo, am I right? Jacopo is the perfect example of a bond servant. Jacopo was not forced to give himself to Edmund. Why did he possibly respond to Edmund that way? Because Edmund spared his life. Jacopo should have been killed. If Edmund had been selfish, he would have said, hey, I want to live and you die. And this is exactly what Jesus came and did for us. You and I are the ones that had the death penalty assigned to us. Not because we had done something wrong, because the nature of the flesh is death. That's what Paul is saying. The idea of, of, of a bond servant is someone that freely gives their life like Jacopo did to Edmond. My encouragement to you is to choose life, not death. Looking at the cross as the standard, that's the breaking point. Going back to the way things were done, that's the flesh. That's, that's the man's best idea to be made right with God versus after the cross when Jesus did it all for us. Edmond forgave Jacopo. Jacopo, in other words, was forgiven much, wasn't he? Remember what Jesus said to the woman that came and washed his feet with her tears? She poured costly perfume on, on his feet. Simon, this, this uh, Pharisee, looked at her and said, man, if he knew that this girl was a sinner, he wouldn't let her do it. What does that tell you about religion? Religion thinks God's here for the clean people. God came for the ones that got it all together. Pharisees felt that way too. Look at all the stuff I'm doing right Versus Jesus' revelation that no, the physician comes for those that are sick. Amen. Jesus said, he who's been forgiven little loves little. That's what the Pharisees put on people. Little by little, God loves you. He loves you until your next sin. And then once you get to that point, his love has ceased. Until you do what? Until you repent. Until you say, I'm sorry, God, for doing that. And then all of a sudden, his love is turned back on again, right? Friends, that is not the new covenant relationship we have with God. Aren't you thankful that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for some sins, he died for how many? All, all of them. Someone say all of them. All. So who do we have more faith in? Sin or righteousness? Who do we have more faith in? Let me put it this way. Do we have more faith in Adam or in Jesus? Jesus. Someone say Jesus. Jesus. That's where we put our hope. That's where we extend our passion is towards what Jesus did for us. And you know something, this passion that we have, this revelation of grace, it spills over, not into just church life, but it, into your life. When you go to the office and you realize that you've made a mistake, or better yet, that your coworkers made a mistake, and you look at them with the same passion that God looks at them with, that he loves them, that he gave everything for them just like he did for you. And when you begin to see people through the light of what their worth is in Christ, you'll treat them differently. You'll talk about them differently. Come on, somebody. You'll get in the car and you won't call up your husband or your wife and start complaining about how bad the people were. In fact, you may call them up and say, "Woo, God loves some of my people. They are rough. Change how you see them. See the value that God sees in them. That's what Edmond did to Dantes, and that's why he said, I know. Uh, he, he said, not Dantes, but what's his name again? Jacopo, that's right. Somebody needs to name their pet Jacopo. <laughs> he knew that by giving Jacopo his life back, that Jacopo would desire to serve him. That's what grace says. Grace says, I'm not demanding anything of you, but I know that when I give you the full freedom of, of grace, that you will surely see the beauty in that. He who's been forgiven little loves little. I love you, God. Okay, I blew it. I know I got I to gotta go into self uh, time out now. I'm sorry, God, forgive me. And we wait for God to forgive us. Some religions even say, if you want to be forgiven, you got to say something a certain way. When in fact, God forgave us all of our sins before we committed the first one. 
If you don't believe that, let me show it to you. Over in, uh, uh, well, we'll we'll just start in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, no, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2, 13. It says that you were dead because of your sins, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Watch what happened when you were dead. It says, then God made you alive with Christ. How did he do that? Because he forgave all our sins. Friends, how many sins is all of them? That's all, right? A-L-L, that's it. All your sins have been washed away. In the very next verse, it says, he canceled the record of charges against us and he took it away. How did he do it? By nailing it to the cross. How long ago was that? It was 2,000 years ago. It was at the cross that sin was resolved. So my question is, why do we keep bringing it forward? Why are we demanding our right to be evil, to be bad, to be, to be sinners when it, clearly Christ died for just the opposite? Instead of preaching to people how rotten they are, we should be preaching to people how forgiven they are. Instead of telling people how bad they are, look, that doesn't change anybody. You already know that. You tried it. You tried condemning yourself. How's it working out for you so far? How far have you come by talking about how bad you are, how bad your kids are, how bad they are, that person over there, how far has that gotten you? Versus the reality, he who's forgiven little loves little. He who is forgiven much loves much. What should we focus on? How much we're forgiven. How much are we forgiven of? All of it. Someone say all. All. I am your man forever. Paul said, look, you can either be under grace or under law. You can be in the jurisdiction of God's goodness or you can be in the jurisdiction of condemnation, of constantly feeling bad, feeling inadequate. Friends, I choose Jesus. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. He talks about the two Adams here. So it's written. He said, the first man, Adam, that's Adam, the very first one, the very first man on the planet. The first man, Adam, he became a living being. He was flesh. He was something that you could see, you could touch him, you could talk to him. That was the first Adam. Watch the differentiation though. It says, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam was the man Adam. Guess who the last Adam is? That's Jesus himself. The verbiage is crucial. First and last. The first Adam is God's first way of interacting with humanity. It's the first effort that God made to communicate with people. And he did it through the flesh. God could not go inside Adam. He would visit with Adam in the garden. He would walk with him on the outside. When Jesus came, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say Jesus was the second Adam. It does call him the second man, but it does not call him the second Adam. Jesus was the last Adam. What does that mean? That means that God sent Adam in the flesh to communicate And there was one more effort that God made. The last effort God was ever going to make with mankind was Jesus, the last Adam, who was a life-giving spirit. And now no longer do we have to communicate as in a garden, call up God. I used to call him on a cell phone. I don't have to call God up on a phone. Hello, it's me you're looking for. That's not how, that's not how I communicate with God. Now God is a life-giving spirit and he dwells on the inside of me. The eternal creator, the one that made the moon and the stars, he lives on the inside of Brandon Cameron Ball. On the inside of every believer, he has made his residence. Who do you have more faith in, the first or the second Adam? It's the second. Jesus came as a life-giving spirit. He came to give us life and that life more abundantly. So why do we fight so hard for our our, our right to please God by what we do? There's nothing wrong with doing good things. That is a natural response to a fully uh, living God on the inside of me. But as soon as I step over into doing something to get something, I'm back into the flesh where I'm trying to prove myself to God. And again, that's what Jesus came to redeem us out of. Under the old covenant, the relationship between flesh and God, it was difficult. Blessings and curses abounded. Very hard to maintain consistent relationship. 
The, the, the way the old covenant would say it is like this. The old covenant was a, a system of dues. If, if you listen, you'll be blessed. If you look, you'll receive. If you bring, if you follow, if you pay attention, if you make, if, if you obey, if you disobey, these are all old covenant commands. This is all about who? It's all about you. If you blow any of these, you're in big trouble because the wages of sin is still death. Aren't you thankful for a new covenant? Amen. See, the old covenant says do, the new covenant says done. What does the new covenant give us promises of? It says you are forgiven. The new covenant says you are healed. You are not about to be, you are blessed. You are righteous, you are holy, you are mighty, you are accepted, and you are loved, ladies and gentlemen. Come on. <laughs> Who do you have more faith in? The flesh, where you gotta do it, or in Jesus, where it's already been done? See, we're no longer trying to get something from God, nothing. I'm not trying to make God happy with me, no. He's already perfectly pleased with Jesus. He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. When you accept that, when you receive that for yourself, now God doesn't look at you as the person that you thought you were. He looks at you just like he does Jesus. And he says, you are my son and my daughter in whom I am well pleased. And when you hear those words, guess what that does? Oh, that ought to charge you up. You may have fallen down on your butt. You may have missed it time and again, but you just need to remind yourself, though a righteous man falls seven times, yet will he rise. How do you rise up? You rise up by saying, I am still right with God. Even though I just did this unthinkable thing, I am still right with God. And it's through that repetition. It's through saying it over and over again. Listen to me. My confession doesn't make God move. I believe in confession, but I ain't looking at who I am. I'm looking at the one I'm confessing towards. I believe in faith, but my faith ain't got nothing to do with it. I got faith in him. He's the one that did it all. I put no confidence in the flesh, in other words. So when I make confessions, I'm not making confessions because if I say it enough times, it'll happen. The new covenant says it's already happened. The new covenant says, my confession just strengthens my resolve. That's right. Yeah, I am healed. Praise the Lord. I'm not trying to get it. I am blessed. I'm not, I didn't just qualify myself from a blessing. The blessing of God is always being poured out on his people. Can I get some help in this church? That's why Paul summed it up in Colossians 2.10. Watch what he said. He said, so also you are complete through what? your union with Jesus Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You are complete. You know, when I went to college, they had grades. Uh, obviously, we all know grades, A, B, C, D, F, but there was a special grade in college called I. And this is a grade nobody wanted. It was the, it was the grade of incomplete. It meant that you hadn't quite, you hadn't failed, but you hadn't quite qualified either. And I see in my heart, we're all holding that eye over our heads. I believe God wants me healed, but I've disqualified myself. A letter of incomplete, a letter of I, you got a little bit more work to do. I know God wants me blessed, but, but don't you know what I did? Don't you know what I said, what I thought, what I looked at, what I clicked on? Don't you know those things, pastor? No, God doesn't look at you with an eye. He says you are complete, not because of you though. It's because of your union with his son. My heart for this church is that we would stop trying so hard. Don't just do something, stand there. Moses said that when the Israelites came up to the Red Sea, God spoke through him and he said, don't worry about it. Stand still and see the salvation of your God. Under the new covenant, Jesus says, you stop trying to figure it all out. I'll tell you when to move. I'll tell you when to step. I'll give you the right instruction, but rest amen. knowing that I've got your future perfectly in the palm of my hand. Can I get an amen? amen. Someone say, I am, complete. I am complete. You just need to stare at that for a second. Are you telling me the Bible says I am complete? Yes. Paul said, 
God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. That word supply means complete. God has already completed everything you have need of. And he's not asking you to beg him for it. What he's telling you is he's already done it. It's already a guarantee. He even went so far as to seal our eternity by the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Stop questioning whether or not you are worthy of his blessing. Friend, if you believe that Jesus is his son, that his blood was enough to cover your sins to remove it, then you are free indeed. Amen. And it doesn't matter what you did. It don't matter what you're about to do. God did it anyway. Amen. I love talking about the radical reality of his goodness. He's only good. Why we keep watering it down? He's good, mostly, but if you turned on Cinemax last night, come on, Jesus. <laughs> he ain't so good then. No, he's good always. I know people that have been blown away that God continues to bless them when they know I deserve bad. They know I should have, why do I keep getting promoted? Why does God continue to, 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 to drive me forward? I'll tell you why, because it's the goodness of God that leads men to change how they think about him. Amen. Not his badness, not his harshness, it's his goodness. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high is his love for those who fear him. People get nervous. Oh, okay, so his love is conditional then because you got to fear God in order to receive that promise. How about God so loved the world, brother? Okay, now I'm going, that was, that was macho, macho man or something. Hulk Hogan. No, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Amen. Come on. That's everybody. How much does God love the world? As high as the heavens are over the earth. And yet we try to make these nice clean containers. And we try to, we try to it's like a little Amazon shipment. And we want to put people, okay, if you'll do this, then we'll ship out this blessing. And they get that blessing, but they're like, but I didn't, but, but, but what about all the other stuff? And it's just become this impossibly complicated scenario. Nobody knows how to receive from God. I've already told you how to receive from him. Only believe. That's the job. That's the work of God. Believe in the one he sent. Some of you say, yeah, you say this stuff a lot. I know I do because Paul did. Like I, there's all kinds of ways to communicate God, I suppose. But when I look at the New Testament, there's one consistent phrase over and over again. And it has to do with the crazy grace that God poured out on mankind. If it was good enough for Paul to preach, then it's what I'm going to take up as well. Amen. Amen. We've, we've created weird factions in the body of Christ. And we, and we come up with these really crazy ways to communicate a way to experience a better life. But how many times have we left Jesus out of the equation? Like, how is he not involved in this at all? Like, we, we get to the point where we're like, okay, Jesus, we got this from here. And then we just go on and we try to get it all figured out. Guess what happened? Danger. That's danger right there. Danger, Will Robbins. Danger, Will. That's danger. All the 40-year-old people, they're loving that. Because the second that you take your eyes off Jesus, where have you put them? On me. Put them on, you start putting your confidence in you. And that's why you start getting nervous and you think, you think that I confess enough today. Look, don't get me wrong, y'all. I believe in confessing the word. Come on now. But if my confidence is in my confession, I'm not looking at Jesus. I don't put any strength. I don't put any credibility in what Brandon is able to accomplish. Remember, we're talking thimble, symbolically now. <laughs> I don't know why I keep saying that. Here we go. <laughs> this is what Paul preached. This is, this is Paul's heart. Acts 14, 7. Watch what Paul was preaching. It says they were preaching the gospel uh, in, in a city called Lystra. They were preaching the gospel. That's an important word. Keep that in, in mind. We we're preaching the gospel. Jesus himself said, hey, it's time to repent and believe the gospel. That word repent, as we always say, does not mean stop sinning. What Jesus literally said was, it's time to metanoia, it's time to change, meta, change the way you think about God. Because there was a whole lot of people that believed God was mean, he was angry, he was upset. He says, it's time to change that. He said, it's time to preach the good news. That's what gospel means. 
The good news, if you're going to a church and it ain't good news when you leave, you don't need to go back to that church. If you leave with a burden, you're in the wrong place because the towel of righteousness, it cleans off the mud from your feet and you ought to leave with a pep in your stizzy. Come on, somebody. (laughs) You ought to leave with something different on you than when you went in that place. So Paul's preaching in Lystra, the gospel in verse eight. It says, and in Lystra, there was a certain man without strength in his feet, for he was sitting. He was a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. This is a man, he's a grown man. He's 20, 30, 40 years old. His entire life, he had never been able to walk. Paul's in a room just like this. Maybe it's outside an amphitheater, but he's talking probably to a crowd this size. And what's he talking about? The Bible said a verse earlier, he's talking, he's preaching the gospel. You know what I bet? I bet it sounded a lot like what I'm talking to you about right now. And while he's saying this, uh, it says in verse number nine, it said, this man heard Paul speaking. Now that word heard is in the imperfect tense. That means it happened over and over again. You and I read that verse and we pass over it. We think, okay, well, he heard Paul for 10 minutes talk about something. No, obviously Paul was in Leicester. This is something he did over and day after day, Paul would have open air meetings. He'd start preaching and people would start coming. They'd start coming to listen. This man was brought to this place and he heard Paul day after day. In verse, uh, the next part of that verse, it says, and Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. He saw it. Why? Because faith has a look. There's a body language of faith. You know, sometimes when I'm preaching, I'll see some people have faith and I'll see some people, they just want to take a nap. (laughs) That's okay. I mean, if you got to catch some Z's, that's cool. But this guy in Lystra, he wasn't. He was on the edge of his seat. Faith has a look. There's something in your body language that says, I believe what you're preaching, man. What's Paul preaching to him? He's preaching grace. He's preaching the gospel. It says he saw that he had faith and he said with a loud voice, who did he talk to? He talked to the man that he saw had faith. He talked to a man that was responding like this has got to be real. And he said to that man, hey, he said, stand up on your feet. And the man disobeyed him. He actually jumped. (laughs) Sort of walking around. Friends, I'm asking you this morning, how's your look? Do you have the look of faith in your life? Is there something in your heart that says, I'm coming out of this thing? Look, I know you may be in debt, but is there a look of faith in you that says this debt ain't gonna be the end of me? I know there may have been an addiction. Some of you may, you may come in here drunk this morning. That drunkness doesn't have to define who you are. You ought to have a look on your life that says, no, I may have been that, but that does not define who I am now. Faith has a look. You may have just come through a heartbreaking divorce, but the look of faith says, that man or woman, they're not gonna define me the rest of my life. I'm coming out of this thing. This man was a cripple. Paul said he saw he had faith to be healed. What does that mean? He was ready. On the day of Passover, when God was leading the Israelites out of Egypt, he said, don't just stand there and hang out eating some some chicken wings. He said, put your belt on, get your shoes on, because I'm about to get you out of this bondage you've been in for 430 years. Faith has a look. Oh, you ought to look like you believe what I'm preaching this morning. There ought to be something inside of you. When I say God's not mad at you, he's madly in love with you. You ought to be like, oh my God, how is that possible? Why? Because faith has a look. You know, when you went out Friday night, you didn't go out in your sweatpants with no makeup on women. what did you do? You went to the bathroom and you got ready. You put it all on, man. Your Your husband was like, baby, we ain't going out now. We can have a home date right up in here. (laughs) No, when you have an expectation that something's coming, we're going somewhere. What do you do? You get ready. Friends, I'm prophesying to you. God says, get ready. Get ready because he's bringing you out. I'm not gonna define what your out is, but I know the God that promised it. It's our choice. Are we gonna live according to the promise of the flesh? According to what Adam provided? 
Or do we believe that Jesus is greater than Adam? Paul was preaching the gospel over and over again. What is that gospel word? Instead of me just telling you it's maybe what we preach, let me show you. What, what Paul preached is actually described earlier in verse number, number three. First of all, back to 14.7, they were preaching the gospel there. Here was the gospel they were preaching. Next verse. Therefore, they stayed a long time in Lystra and they spoke boldly in the Lord who was bearing witness to what? To the word of his grace. They spoke over and over and over again about one thing. And it wasn't how to be a better employee. It wasn't how to be a better husband. It wasn't how to get out of debt. It was the grace of God. And friends, if you'll embrace the grace, it will make you a better husband. It will get you out of debt. It will lead you into places where your pastures are green. How did we get away from Jesus' own words? Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. How have we made it? We've made it like, don't be afraid. If you keep being perfect, God will bless you. We've made it that, and it's impossible when we put people in bondage over and over again. We've taken people that God said they're perfect, and we've erased perfect, and we put an I am. No, you're imperfect. You're close, but you got a few more things to do. Friends, that is the work of the flesh. That is not the work of grace. And listen to me. I do not apologize for preaching this because I'm not making this stuff up. I'm sticking with what the Bible teaches us about grace. Paul taught the gospel. What's the gospel? It is the word of his grace. And what happened when grace was preached? It says he would grant God granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. You want a sign and a wonder in your life. It's not because you're doing something special. It's because you're looking at Jesus day in and day out. You need freedom in your body. Stop looking for a preacher to lay hands on you. Start looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. I believe in laying hands. Jesus said, you'll do it. But if you you say that's the only way it's gonna happen, then you have shortchanged how amazing the grace of God is. What was Paul preaching? He was preaching grace. Someone say, he was a grace preacher. That's what he did over and over again. Look, let me close down with this this morning. You've been so attentive. Thank you for being such good listeners. I believe that God has your your best days in front of you. I believe the days of you begging for help from God are, are long gone. As long as this church is here, as long as I'm the pastor of this church, you will not hear me ever bring you into the bondage of works. You will never hear me tell you that you gotta try harder. Because as we've already established, your efforts bring nothing, no results. The result it brings is you're proud of you. You feel self-justified for a minute. No, Jesus came as the last Adam, never to come again. There is no more dispensation. God's not gonna send another. That's why over in Hebrews, the, the, the author said, Look, there's no more sacrifice for sin. If you don't believe it was Jesus, there's nothing else left. Like that's, that's, your, that's the last stop. And if you've heard and you reject it, there's no more hope because you can't conjure up your own sacrifice. It's Jesus. As you know, our passion is to see you come out, is to see you and your family lifted up. That doesn't happen because you know all the things that you're supposed to know. It happens when you strip away what religion has taught you. You take out all the artificial structural supports and you realize that your only foundation in this life is the perfect obedience of Jesus. That's why Paul said, every day you take authority over your thoughts. Not to your obedience, but you take authority, you take them captive to the obedience of Jesus. That he was perfectly obedient. That's what the last Adam came to accomplish. I'm thankful that when Jesus says, it's finished, he didn't mean come back in a little bit later and clean up what I didn't quite finish up for you. There's no incomplete grade hanging over your head, y'all. God gave you a complete You pass with flying colors. 
And it's that revelation that happens on the inside of you. You're going to be like Jacopo. You're going to say, God, I am your man forever because you spared me when I should have justly died. I love what God is emphasizing in this church. I love you. You've given this ministry life. My words wouldn't matter if you didn't care. When you show up every week, you vote with your feet. When you invest with your finances, when you bring your, your energy, your, your passion. Guys, lives are literally being transformed. And I believe that we haven't seen anything yet. This is not a church that's here to make a man known. Nobody but Jesus. But I believe that when we're done, when I look back on my life 50 years from now, when I'm 93, I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey guys, y'all still teaching some grace, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. If you're 93 and that, that's not how you talk. <laughs> I'm just, I'm guessing, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I believe when it's all said and done, we pass over to the other side, God's gonna look at us. He said, man, you guys nailed it. You did exactly what I asked you to do. How beautiful, how wonderful it is to know that we're on track with what God's invited us to do, amen?